Welcome to this episode of Kennedy Saves the World. And it's the happiest of happy hours. I wish we were sponsored by Snapple, but we're not. But today we're going to enjoy some. And one of my very favorites, whenever Corinne Jean-Pierre makes a misstep, it makes me realize how incredibly brilliant Dana Perino is (laughs) and how hard the job of Mm. White House Press Secretary is. Uh, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Are you I ready for happy hour? Being, I'm so, uh, this is my first happy hour. Is that my first yes. time on the podcast? Mm-hmm. It is my first happy hour. That's I love your right. podcast. I think it's excellent. I know how much you love iced tea. I do love iced tea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do love iced tea. Don't worry about that. Mm, I'll ice. take those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not worried about the strays. You come here. Come into mommy's little cup. There we go. Just a little bit of iced tea between gal pals. You never know. Yeah, yeah. It's just, like it's just it's Galentine's know. Day post post Galentine's post, post Day. Galentine's Day. Exactly right. Oh, mm-hmm. well, that's looks pretty. Looks like whiskey though, doesn't it? <laughs> what? That's so weird. It's not. It's peach iced tea <laughs> by Snapple. Okay, here you awesome. go. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. And your gorgeousness. Thank and you. Your hard Thank work you. And your thoughtfulness. Mm. Oh. It sure is iced tea. It's peachy, huh? <laughs> nom, nom, nom. How did they get all that flavor? How did the five go tonight? I do not know. <laughs> um, so I do want to talk to you about press secretary work like requirements. Because I look at Crean Jean-Pierre and she has a thankless job. Even though, and it must be very different for Republican administrations. Because you know when you're in a Democrat administration... The press is oh, by and yeah. large going to mm-hmm. be on your side mm-hmm. and you're going to have buddies that you can call on and you know they're going to set you up. But even with the softballs that she gets, she she's not good at the job. I don't know that she's ever been up to it. Mm-hmm. Can you learn on the job for that job? That's a great question. I was the deputy for quite a while before I became the press secretary and I had been a spokesperson from Capitol Hill to private sector work, uh, and then at, at different parts of the administration. One of the thing, one of the jobs I had that really helped me along the way was I served as the ace, one of many spokespeople at the Justice Department mm-hmm. right after 9-11 and did that for about 10 months. Yeah. And it was almost like being in your first year of law school because you had to learn all of the lingo so and the terms reading. and yes. which court means that. That served me so well because a lot of what you talk about has to do with the law. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, one place where I didn't have a lot of experience until I got into the deputy role was on foreign policy. And at that time, foreign policy was about 80% of the questions I would get in the briefing room. We were at war. Yes. Right. Then when the surge in Iraq started improving the situation there and alleviating a lot of the casualties, things looked a little bit more stable. We had the financial crisis. Oh my gosh. So then I went right into economics. And to me, I always wanted to make sure that I covered all the bases. I had a rule with my deputies Mm -hmm. that I should never be surprised by a question at the briefing. So that meant that they had to make sure that they were coordinated. That meant talking to the press, Mm -hmm. answering their questions. I always told the press, we will always answer you. We will always get back to you. I might not have an answer for you, but I will try. I was never late to a briefing, but partly that was because I run on time and President Bush ran early. Oh yeah. And And also was a runner. Uh, Yes. And also I never wanted the press to think that I was not prepared. Yeah. Right. Part of the power in the room is to say, I know more than you guys do. Okay. So hit me what you got. And if I didn't know the answer, I would say something like, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but by five o'clock today, you'll have an answer for me. See, but that is a much more honest response. And And it's easy. Like like people who fudge and that's a thing I don't like about Corinne Jean-Pierre. And she's like, I've already answered this many times. It's like, yeah, yeah let's say you have. It does get repetitive. Answer it again. Mm. Because there is a sense of urgency, especially if it's mm-hmm. coming from a mainstream outlet that mm-hmm. is usually hospitable. Right. I mean, sometimes you listen to the questions from the briefing room and you think, oh my gosh, these are terrible. Yeah. Um, there's an added thing here, I think, for her that is a little bit different. One, let's go back. Let's think about Jen Psaki, who was the first Biden press Raggedy. secretary. Mm-hmm. In the Obama administration, she served as the spokesperson at the State Department. Oh, like Marie Harf. Yes. And a ton of experience comes from that. Those are tough reporters. I mean, also, those are reporters who only cover foreign policy. Like, those are reporters who have very specific beats. They can go deep and they want actual answers. They're not like Jim Acosta. They're not showboating. And they know all the history. So sometimes that gets difficult. Um, I 
I, I don't know all that is a concern for Corinne Jean-Pierre. One, I think condescension does not come off well in a briefing or mm-hmm. to the American people. I think being exasperated by the question I've already answered that. Right. And I, I, yeah. I, I, you hear that. And I'm like, not going to speak to that. But I also think that a lot of this comes from the top, right? They have bad facts, really bad facts. So bad facts means that her job is harder. Mm-hmm. I honestly don't know what they're going to do about his mental fitness and faculties because time only goes in one direction. And as my friend Colin Reed said, father time is undefeated. Yes. He's not going to get better. That's and that's not the economy her might fault. the border right. might exactly. the situation in Gaza, all those things could, could get resolve. Better. Absolutely. But what we're dealing with in terms mm-hmm. of his mental decline, which is not age, because there are people mm-hmm. in their 80s and 90s who could run circles Did around. Did you see him. Dr. Siegel asked his 98-year-old father a whole series of questions in the New York Post the other day and he knew the answers to all of them. Wow. So it's just it's just and that's not a knock on Joe Biden, it's just what it is. But the other thing is I feel like you have to have a really close personal relationship with the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Jen Psaki had that with Biden. Think of COVID. They kept Biden in a bubble. Yes. Right. So there was no, as I was talking about the other day, my my first solo trip with the president was as a deputy. And we went to the Boy Scouts Jamboree and Marine One. And on the way home, he shared his peanut butter honey sandwiches with me. And that's how we got to know each other. And he asked me all about growing up in the West. And he would always ask about my family. So I don't think they actually have a lot of personal interaction with him. There's not a deep personal relationship. Think about it. Corinne Jean-Pierre did not work for Joe Biden Mm. in the Senate, right? He has some people that work for him in the upper echelons of the White House that have known him for years. She doesn't. No. There's not a close personal relationship. Does she know the first lady very well? I don't think so. So then you also have the fact that they layered next to her John Kirby, who is a very good spokesperson, super professional and knows all the foreign policy questions. I was wondering when she was appointed, you know, it's like, because we saw Kirby being like the national security spokesperson. Mm -hmm. And there was one for us too, but I didn't bring him to the briefing every day. Yeah. I I mean, but he's so much better than she is. Mm -hmm. It's it's actually painful to see their skill level. And it's, it's not racist to say that he's better at the job than she is. It's not because he's a male. He's been very gracious. It's not because he's white. Yeah, he has. Don't you think he's been very gracious to her and deferential, right? And he's so polite. Yeah, and he he says like, hey, you know, when when things sort of normalize in the Middle East, I'm not going to be here Mm -hmm. this often. But Mm -hmm. she can't handle the job. So don't you think, like Biden, it's more cruel to keep them in that position? Mm, No, I, I I think that it has diminished the position, but I think that's also partly technology, and partly Trump. Because if you think about um, one of the reasons you had a press secretary is because the president is not going to be talking to the people all the time. He didn't have time to do that. Now he didn't have the tools to do that. Yeah. So RF, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> FDR, mm-hmm. not RFK, please. FDR gets the radio. And now he can talk directly yes, to the people. And they fireside can chat. Him. John F. Kennedy and Reagan are like, oh, television? Mm. I have this new, television is great. But you still need a spokesperson to do the day-to-day work. Yes. Then you get to a 24-7 news cycle. I didn't have any social media to contend with when I was press secretary. None. Towards, towards the end, a little bit. I was like, mm-hmm. what's this Facebook thing? Yeah, I don't know. That's right. I don't have MySpace a Twitter. And the reason the they end. told me to get a Twitter account, they convinced me to get a Twitter account after I left the White House because this girl that was working for me at the time said, I'll, I'll show you how to post pictures of your dog. I was like, I'm in. <laughs> that's great. So now you have people 24-7 yeah. getting their news constantly. And the president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, says, "I'll just, I'll just do that myself." Mm-hmm. So, so we all got used to it. It was chaotic, but it was amazing. Mm-hmm. You got, you heard right from the president. You don't. Sometimes, the White House press secretary, our friends, would be up there giving a statement, and the president was tweeting something else, contradicting it. Biden, you don't hear from him. I can't stand how they put him out in front of the Marine One mm-hmm. when the blades are whirring, and they think he can actually carry a conversation with reporters yeah no like he talks to reporters all the time that. that's so i think that's so professionally insulting yeah well there there's a lot about that department that you know from an outsider's perspective seems to be unprofessional and it's also mm. you know it's like the job of the presidency it should be sacred and you know what the president has to convey to the american people into the world 
that should be of the highest importance. Mm. But, you know, to your point, when Corinne Jean-Pierre seems exacerbated and exasperated, rather, and ill-prepared, it diminishes the presidency. Don't go anywhere. More Kennedy saves the world right after this. You know the other thing that happened that I don't like? I think it's a bad... Tra- I like tradition. Mm-hmm. And one of the traditions when I took over was the whoever was the most senior wire reporter called the briefing, mm-hmm. right? They would start. That was always first question. It was either Terry Hunt or Steve Holland of AP or Reuters. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. And who was the lady, the older lady? Oh, like, Helen, right. Thomas. Helen Thomas. Helen uh, Yeah, but we I, I didn't count her as the most senior wire reporter, but maybe I should have because she was at UPI. But it was AP or Reuters. Okay. And it, if they weren't there, Bloomberg. Okay? okay. That sort of changed as well because then with the 24-7 news cycle, every news outlet was a wire. But let's just say, so they started it. I would take the questions, take the questions, work the rows, work the rows, work the rows. I didn't get to just close my binder and walk out of the room. Mm-hmm. The tradition was they would say, Thank you. Really? They ended the press conference. Stop it. Now that ended, I believe, I believe it was during the Trump administration. I think the Trump administration press secretary stopped that, you know, and and with a very dramatic slamming of the binder Mm -hmm. and a walking out. Mm -hmm. But to me, I was like, oh, I think that the the challenge of the job sometimes was looking at Terry and Steve like, are you going to let me up? Are you going to let me out of here? I got to go do stuff, guys. But they would also keep things efficient. Like if yeah. the re- questions in the briefing room were getting repetitive, they would call it. Is it annoying when a reporter asks three questions? Like it seems like so no. many people have three parters now. Um, it doesn't bother. It didn't bother me so much because like my briefings weren't also televised every day. It wasn't like national television every day. Every once in a while, it would be important. And I don't think the press secretary job should be that important, mm. actually. I don't think the press secretary should be on the Sunday shows. Those, that's to me, again, traditionally, I think those are for good policy people. Who do you think the best press secretary? Who's your favorite? Um, and, and it could be from either party. And, and, and not from the West Wing. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, Marlon Fitzwater mm-hmm. was incredible. He, he served Reagan and Bush. Mm. Eight years he did that job. Wow. The last four years of Reagan mm-hmm. and the first and only term of George H.W. Bush. He wrote a book called Call the Briefing. And if there's anybody here listening who uh, loves that job, loves Reagan, Mm -hmm. wants to know more about that era, that is one of the best Washington, D.C. books I've ever read. So I loved him. Mm -hmm. I also am going to say, I thought Mike McCurry was an incredible press secretary. He was very likable. For Bill Clinton. Super likable. Mm -hmm. Very likable. And also, oh, this is some good trivia. Cameras were were not allowed in the briefing room until 1997-8. Did not know that. Okay, so before... Because they, they feel like... It's sort of like cameras in the courtroom. Yes. Like, everybody's... You need to pay attention, need to listen with your ears, and, you know, they had audio. That was it, I think, at the time. But the world was changing. Technology was changing. Mm-hmm. Cable news was here. And, and now CNN and eventually Fox and um, MSNBC, they, they're hungry. They want content all the time. Mm. And Mike McCurry makes a decision that he is going to allow for the first time ever cameras in the briefing room. Wow. Guess what day was the very first day? Monica Lewinsky day. The cameras were allowed in the briefing Stop room. Stop it. it and they the, decided that before the It news was the broke? day the Drudge Report. Yep, exactly. Oh, my garden. And he'll always say. And also, the thing is, like, the, the reporters weren't very performative. Before oh. cameras were in the briefing room. Yeah. That's why I'm not for cameras in the Supreme Court. I'm just not. No, me we neither. We don't need anybody to be fine, but th- they don't need We don't to need be... performance. Yes, I agree completely. I, and so I, I think that that's kind of an interesting thing. I remember one time they were drilling Mike McCurry about um, Monica Lewinsky's story of some sort. And I remember he had a great line. He said, look, guys, I'm double parked in a no comment zone. <laughs> <laughs> and the reporters, like, you know, it gave a chance, like, okay, yeah, we get it. Yeah. He tried and let him go. Yeah. And of course, Tony Snow was an amazing press secretary. He was amazing. Ari Fleischer was extremely good during the war. Yeah. Very, very good. And I think President Bush was very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't he, though? He was. He had <laughs> but, uh, three he, outstanding. But not only that, but he had good judgment, right? Personnel, if, um, this, he writes uh, in Decision Points, which is about the 14 most important decisions in his life. Mm-hmm. First one was to stop drinking. That's chapter one. Mm-hmm. Chapter two is personnel. And he talks about hiring the right people to do the jobs. Do you think that inspired you and your mentorship? 100%. 
And absolutely. Also because I tell this great story about Tony Snow, who um, was a giant of a press secretary, a historian. I mean, the contrast between you guys. You've yes, written about he this. He was six five. I'm five feet tall. It's so funny. <laughs> he had such big shoes to fill. But I'll never forget that the day before he left uh, for his last day, he came into my office. He said, how are you doing? I was like, I'm terrible. I mean, how am I supposed to fill your shoes? It's going to be terrible. Ugh. And he said, stand up. So I did. And he put his hands on my shoulder and he shook me a little bit. And he said, you are better at this than you think you are. Mm. And about two weeks later, I was going from the Oval Office. I need to get to the briefing. I never want to be late. And I didn't go back to the press secretary's office and grab my folder with all my notes before I went in. And I was about to turn around, but they'd seen me. So I walked out there with no notes. And I felt like I was on a high wire without a net. Mm -hmm. And it was the best briefing I ever had wow. because I let go. And you had to trust yourself And I already completely. knew that I did know the material. And because I had this great relationship with the president and I was with him a lot, I knew what he thought. And I could speak for him. That's one problem I think Corinne has. She doesn't have a lot of interaction with Joe Biden. So mm -hmm. how was she actually speaking for him? What did he think? What was he doing? Where was he? What was it like? How was that conversation? Mm -hmm. Were you in the situation room? How did it go? Like, I don't think there's a lot of understanding him because there just can't be at this point in no, his I, life. No, I think they still probably keep him pretty well shielded. And I think part of it is if he has too much incoming, it freaks him out. Like yeah. he, he And he's mean. Overloaded. You yeah, know, you he's mad. That. He's, he's, he's gotten, angry. He's gotten more angry. I think that they have a better, I, they probably have a better relationship than I'm describing. Look, and I don't look, I'm just Would you guessing. tell her to to ditch the binder and trust herself? Yeah. Uh, yes. Because there are times when I'm like, she's reading, we wish everyone a really nice day. I'm like, you don't need to read that. Chuck Schumer does the same thing. Drives me up a wall. I'm like, you glasses. are the Senate yeah, majority yeah, leader yeah, and you yeah, can't yeah, say yeah. we wish everyone a good day. Yeah. Like I, that drives me kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. Everybody knows a little bit more than they think. Um, and I think setting that aside mm -hmm. and just giving it a shot one time yeah. would be really beneficial. Are you a phenomenal dancer? <laughs> no. No, um, I have been taking some dance lessons, some ballroom dance lessons. You know what it's great for? The thing I'm obsessed with, posture. Oh, yes. Posture. Boy, does it make me think. Yeah, because- And you, it's changed a lot to... of things. Yeah. And like the positioning, like, oh, okay. And my dance instructor, he's from Serbia and his wife's from New Jersey. He had a great point the other day. I don't know who knows. I was probably slouching at some point. He goes, in this office, we have- dance office posture at all times. <laughs> it's like at other offices, they have different office posture. Here, it's a dance office posture. Wow. So now I'm like, I'm, I like realize I'm like, oh, I can do that. And I've built up some, some muscles to be able to do that. That's amazing. The other day they said, oh, you have to compete. I'm like, oh, no, I'm never, ever doing that. When I was 28, I learned how to play the flute, 27, 26, 27. Nice. I always wanted to learn how to play the flute. And this woman was teaching me, convinced me to go to a recital. And I did. And I was the only adult Stop and it was it. mortifying. I could still cry about it. And I'm never going, I'm never doing that again. Did your mom go? No, but Peter went and it was, Did uh, he cheer and for next you? time you see him in the elevator, <laughs> he can tell you how embarrassing it was for me. I think that sounds incredible. Oh. Um, I was uh, blackballed from my kids events because I cheer too loud. Oh, and I'm like, okay, really? well at some point, some someday you will understand. Wait, by your children or by the other parent? No, by my children. By your children. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> I have a friend who, um, Michelle Chase, if you're listening, which I know you probably will. She, I think that her child does not want to see her. So she sort of sneaks in oh, yeah. and like hides behind people. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> he's a wrestler and he's a very good one. Ben is his name. Well done, Ben. Well, good job, Ben. Hopefully he will wrestle his way to a division one scholarship. <laughs> exactly. This is what we're hoping. And then become a wrestling billionaire. <laughs> we take care of just like forever. Tyrus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. What incredible stories we have here at Fox. It's one of my favorite things. That's great. Is people, and if you take the time to talk to people, people have come from such interesting backgrounds. I mean, think about it. Jimmy Fallon was a cab driver. Brian Brenberg was an economics professor. Mm -hmm. You were the White House press secretary. Mm -hmm. Steve Ducey was half of Siegfried and Roy for 10 years in Vegas. Mm -hmm. That's not true, but <laughs> it would be pretty <laughs> nice. Did you see me? I was like, um, <laughs> as if I knew that. <laughs> yes, that's right. Was... Like, oh, really? Oh, that was interesting. I missed um, that part. Thank you so much for coming, But I Brian. do think it's interesting that Brian Kilmeade was the first announcer for the UFC fights. Yes, and a comic. 
Yes. Yeah. I could see it. He's very funny. <laughs> and he absolutely loves sports. All right. Well, cheers. Here's well, to, cheers to the ice continued tea. success to ice tea and to learning to play the flute for your own personal recital. <laughs> this has been Kennedy Saves the World along with Dana Perino. I'm Kennedy. Cheers. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts and Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app. Oh, go ahead and leave me a review while you're there. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You've been listening to Kennedy Saves the World on the Fox News Podcast Network.